Um, my name is um, Bart Ziegler, and I am president of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. Samuel Lawrence Foundation is a nonprofit which serves to expand access to the arts, science, and education for collaborative solutions to our planet. This is our first Friday series, a monthly webinar. Uh, it's on the first Friday of every month. And today we are extremely fortunate to have a partnership with Blue Planet Alliance and Brooklyn Story Lab. Today's topic is accelerating the renewable era, energy solutions for a regenerative planet. We are extremely fortunate to have three truly extraordinary guests. We welcome Blue Planet Alliance, Inc. Rogers and Stanford University Professor Mark Z. Jacobson in a discussion about how to achieve sustainable future through renewable energy. I'd like to introduce Hank Rogers. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, he is determined to eliminate mankind's dependence on carbon-based fuels. Hank is was a driving force behind Hawaii's legislative mandate to transition to 100% renewable energy by 2045. Since then, he founded Blue Planet Alliance to try and replicate that success initially with island countries and then all countries around the world. Before he turned his focus to environmental protection, he pioneered Japan's computer game industry. Gamers worldwide recognize Hank as the visionary behind the incredible reach of Tetris, one of the most popular video games in history. A movie that just came out earlier this year on Apple TV, Tetris, tells the story of how Hank partnered with the Russian inventor to bring the game to the masses. Thank you for uh, coming, Hank. Joining Hank is Mark Z. Jacobson, one of the world's leadest, leading thinkers on, on climate policy. He was gracious enough to come on to this uh, first Friday series again. Um, and I want to, I, instead of introducing him, I will read his, um, from his book, which we have. A dozen copies for the first 12 students that email us, sign up for our website, Samuel Lawrence Foundation website, and, um, and uh, we'll send a dozen copies to the, to the first students who ask for it. They can put it in their libraries. Um, the, the, Mark C. Jacobson is a professor of civil and environmental engineering and director of the Atmospheric Energy Program at Stanford University. He's published six books and over 175 peer-reviewed papers. His work forms the scientific basis of the Green New Deal and many laws and commitments for cities, states, and countries to transition to 100% renewable electricity and heat generation. He received the 2018 uh, Jude Friedman Lifetime Achievement Award and in 2019 was selected as one of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy. In 2022, he was chosen as the World Visionary Clean Tech Influencer of the Year. He served on an advisory committee to the U.S. Secretary of Energy, appeared in a TED Talk on television shows and co-founded The Solutions Project. Welcome. Uh, Thank you, Bart. Lastly, just a privilege to have you on. Lastly, we have the pleasure of being joined by Lance Gould, CEO of Brooklyn Story Labs. Brooklyn Story Lab is um, uh, uh, just a phenomenal organization. I urge you to look in, to to look up its website, and he is going to moderate today's proceedings. Lance is a former journalist who led newsrooms at name brand publications like Huffington Post, the New York Daily News, the Boston Phoenix, and Spy Magazine. Today, he leads Brooklyn Story Lab, where he works with purpose-driven organizations like ours to help them better reach global audiences. And now, with great privilege, I turn things over to Lance. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Bart. It was a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, and with the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. First, some very brief housekeeping items for the audience. The chat will be open for the duration of the webinar, so click on the chat icon on your Zoom toolbar to open your chat box. And to start, please let us know from where you're tuning in today with a brief greeting in the chat, and feel free to add comments there as well. Let us know where you're, where you're watching. For questions, we'll be using the Q&A box, so click on the Q&A icon on your Zoom menu to submit your questions. And pl please submit all questions to the Q&A box rather than the chat. You can, you can submit questions at any time, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can toward the end of this session. We are recording this webinar, and we'll share the video and the transcript on the Samuel Lawrence Foundation website in the following days. Now, let's talk about accelerating the renewable era, energy solutions for a regenerative planet. <clears throat> According to the UN's IPCC report, the sixth assessment, we have less than seven years to change our destructive habits before we cause irreversible negative impact to the planet, particularly around dirty energy. And those negative impacts seem to become more overt every year. This summer has been brutal with heat domes and unrelenting 100 degree weather in the American South, generational floods in Vermont, wildfires in Canada and throughout Europe and Australia, and desertification throughout the Middle East and North Africa region, which has spurred employment and refugee crises, which have led to political instability and supply chain disruptions. We can no longer pretend this confluence of crises is not related. But on the bright side, our speakers will show that a sustainable future with renewable energy is entirely within reach if we have the political will to achieve it. So Mark, let's start with you. First, just as a baseline, can you give our audience a brief scientific explanation of why carbon-based fuels are so harmful to the planet? Well, fuels, any combustion fuels are harmful, not only in terms of air pollution, not only in terms of climate, but also in terms of air pollution. Uh, 7 million, or actually it's about 7.4 million people die worldwide each year from air pollution. About 90% of that is from energy related air pollution. And the same fuels that are burned that produce air pollution also produce greenhouse gases. And such greenhouses are exacerbating climate damage through global warming. There are also certain particles that cause climate damage that also cause health problems, namely black and brown carbon particles, which are from diesel exhaust, uh, uh, jet fuel burning, burning, and also biomass and biofuel burning. These particles are dark and they absorb sunlight, heat up the air directly, like a million times more powerfully than even carbon dioxide per unit mass, but they don't last in the atmosphere that long. Nevertheless, they are the second leading cause of global warming after carbon dioxide and methane and they cause human health problems. So we want to reduce uh, particles and get greenhouse gases simultaneously to address climate change and air pollution health. And by transitioning to renewable energy, we will also provide energy security, which is the third major problem facing the world today. Well, th thank you for that background and that baseline. It's, it's so helpful. And, and knowing that humans bear such a lion's share of responsibility for the crisis that we're now suffering through, is it possible, and we're just trying to make a, a linear narrative here to show uh, that if we do take steps to eliminate fossil fuels and dirty energy, is it possible that a change in our behavior would result in improved environmental and sustainable conditions? Uh, yes, I believe so. I mean, most uh, about 75 to 80 percent of all greenhouse gases and the particles that affect climate are from energy, and about 90 percent of air pollutants are from energy. And so we, we can, if we change our energy infrastructure, we can go a long way towards uh, solving both problems, air pollution and global warming together. Um, however, the impacts on air pollution will be immediate. I mean, as soon as we stop emitting particles that cause human health problems, uh, people will become healthier and fewer people will die each year. Climate damage uh, will take longer to recover because some of the main components of global warming, well, there's carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas, and there's also methane, nitrous oxide. These are long-lived uh, gases, and if we stop emitting them today, they'll still persist in the atmosphere for decades to come. However, we estimate that if we eliminate 80% of all energy and non-energy emissions, um, those non-energy emissions include from bio, uh, open biomass burning, that's permanent deforestation, uh, methane from agriculture, such as landfills, well, also landfills, uh, but manure, uh, the 
uh, and also digestive tracts of sheep and cattle, and also from rice paddies and nitrous oxide from fertilizers and halogens, which are like these uh, chlorofluorocarbons are an example of a halogen. If we stop those emissions as well as energy emissions, uh, if we stop 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2035 to 2050, uh, we estimate that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can go down to about uh, 350 parts per million by 2100. And uh, we will reverse our global warming that's occurring today. However, this is a big ask, and we really need to set strong policies to actually accomplish this goal. So like the great Jim Carrey once said, you're telling me there's a chance. There is a chance. We can, if we, we put our we can do free this. collective willpower. <laughs> exactly. If we have um, Hank, go ahead, Mark. No, that's, it. that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Hank, you've been involved in the fight for a more sustainable plan for almost 15 years. The quest to end the use of carbon-based fuel sounds like an impossible stretch goal. One, five, 15. Um, but your work has demonstrated that if you can get small wins, you can build a path to a larger victory. Tell us about how you started in Hawaii and what you did there. Well, um, I, I formed the uh, Blue Planet Foundation in Hawaii to end the use of carbon-based fuel in Hawaii. Um, my, my mission is to end the use of carbon-based fuel in the world, but I believe that uh, before I can ask people in other places to clean their room, I have to clean my room. My room is Hawaii, or was Hawaii. Um, Hawaii spends $5 billion a year on oil and a billion dollars on coal when we got started. 30% um, of, uh, of the fuel, of the, of the oil went to uh, jet fuel. 30% uh, went to ground transportation. That's 40% left for uh, making electricity. And so um, that's $2 billion of, of oil and a billion dollars worth of coal. Now, Hawaii only has a million and a half people, so you can do the calculation. $3 million that are going to uh, electricity. Um, when Hawaii is, how can I say, it's the mecca of renewable energy. We have the best solar in the country because of the southernmost state. Uh, we have trade winds, which means we have a very steady supply of wind, and we have geothermal. We live on a hot spot, uh, as expressed by volcanoes, and so geothermal should be and can be a huge source of, of energy, and yet we're burning fossil fuel. Um, so we went through a number of different things uh, to try to get the politicians to come on our side and uh, the, the electric company. The electric company didn't give us uh, the time of day. They, have a, they had a monopoly. Their reaction was, this is how we make electricity. That's it. Uh, why should we change? The politicians were, you know, basically they don't move unless the people move. So how do we get the people to move? We got to the, to the people through the children. We had uh, children go door to door and exchange 300,000 light bulbs, for example. Uh, we had other children uh, draw on sidewalks where uh, high tide would be in a one meter rise in sea level. Um, all of this came to a, uh, a head when we passed the, the nation's first 100% renewable energy law. So in Hawaii has a mandate uh, to go 100% renewable energy for electricity by 2045. 2045 was a negotiation between us and the politicians. They wanted 2050, we wanted 2040, we settled for 2045. Um, turns out to be a great date. That is the 100th anniversary of the United Nations. So today I'm working on ending the use of carbon-based fuel in the world by 2045. And by the That's way, since start. then, 20, 20 other states have copied our legislation. So it's moving across the country. Um, and uh, by the way, maybe your next question will be, how is it working? But <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> well, you, you read my mind. It's a great start that you got this legislative <laughs> victory uh, uh, in Hawaii. But what about the practicality of the achievement? It's one thing to be able to legislate the idea. But what about getting the work done on the ground and, and the probability of getting it done? Right. So, um, yeah. So, first of all, the, the utility never thought about it before. They, it was just not part of what they think about. And uh, when the mandate passed, they had to think about it. And uh, they were the ones that were fighting us when we were trying to pass the law. And uh, six months after we passed the mandate, they came out and said publicly that they, they figured it out. They could do this and they could do it by 2040. Um, and then uh, we started thinking, well, how can we make sure that they actually do this? 
um, because it's nice for people to have, you know, a, a goal. So what we did, we changed the, the business model of the utility. Their old business model was to make 10% on the price of oil. 10% on the price of oil. Now, price of oil is about 25 cents, so 10, 10% is about 2.5 cents. Uh, when they put out RFPs for wind and solar, wind and solar came in at 8 cents per kilowatt hour. And if you add um, storage, like batteries, we're up to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So, I mean, do the math. If we say you can make 3 cents per kilowatt hour, they're making more money. So the fact that they would make more money by switching to renewables, of course, causes the, uh, uh, a complete change, starting with their shareholders. You know, of course, if, if we have them a way to make more money, they're definitely going to change. And so Hawaii is moving much faster than we than we ever expected. Uh, our original goal was to achieve 40% renewable energy by 2030. We've already reached 40% in Hawaii. So if you just, remarkable. Uh, first of all, draw the line in the sand and then uh, basically incentivize all the people involved, um, then it's a win-win-win. So the electric company makes more money. The rate payers pay less money for electricity. Um, and the environment gets better. And, and we're no longer, and, and from 2045, we will no longer be contributing to um, the climate crisis. That's amazing. And, and congratulations for what, what you've achieved there and for how, uh, how well it's going already. Mark, the, the challenge of the climate crisis is so daunting particularly the understanding that we seemingly have to upend our relationship to energy as we know it, and as Hank just demonstrated in why that they're, they're doing to some extent. Do we, do, we, do we already have the technologies we need to solve the climate problem worldwide, just not, not in Hawaii, but, but all over? And do we need nuclear carbon capture, direct air capture, bioenergy, these other uh, uh, solutions to get us there? Well, we have 95% of all the technologies we need to solve the problem with just clean renewable energy, which I define as wind, water, and solar, which includes geothermal in there as well. And you know, small amounts of tidal and wave power are also included as wind, water, and solar. So that includes onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, solar heat, uh, geothermal electricity and heat, hydroelectricity, and tidal wave. Now, we also have that we also have storage, the main types of storage we need, pumped hydroelectric power, hydroelectric dams or storage, and we don't propose to increase that, but use existing hydro more efficiently. Uh, batteries, right now, California has on the order of five gigawatts of battery. It can meet uh, d during all but summer, it can meet up to 20 percent to 20 even up to 24 percent of its peak electricity demand just with the batteries after the sun goes down for example uh, in the summer it's about uh, 10 to 14 percent of the peak demand and that's just growing just just in the last couple of years we've added all these batteries um, there's other types of battery storage <clears throat> we have heat storage in water and underground we have cold storage in ice and in water <clears throat> and we also have hydrogen um, hydrogen will be used should be used only for limited purposes and it should only be what's called green hydrogen which is from clean renewable wind water solar electricity and those purposes are uh, steel production ammonia production uh, long distance transport and some grid some uh, grid storage electricity storage uh, they operate like batteries with when hydrogen is with a fuel cell it can be used but uh, we find that batteries are better, they're more efficient than using hydrogen for fuel cells, except in some cases, combining some hydrogen fuel cells is useful for the grid. Uh, and in terms of what we don't have is long-distance transport through long-distance aircraft and ships that haven't, but well, we know how to do that. They, they will either be electric, battery electric, or hydrogen fuel cell electric. And we do have short-distance electric aircraft and ships now. Uh, but long distance, like a 747, will probably have to be, for example, a hydrogen fuel cell. And we know how to do that, but it's, uh, we don't have any commercial uh, technology. We estimate by 2030 to 2035, those will probably be the last things to transition. Do we need carbon capture, direct air capture, bioenergy, new, small modular nuclear reactors, blue hydrogen? Uh, no. So we need to transition as fast as possible. 
And as I mentioned before, 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2035 to 2050. And we want to eliminate air pollution. So any technology that, first of all, continuous air pollution is not a technology that we want to continue. So anything related to carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, electrofuels, these all increase air pollution. They also increase carbon dioxide. You might ask, well, how does carbon capture increase carbon dioxide? Well, imagine all carbon capture and direct air capture uh, requires energy, requires electricity to run, so no, except for trees. I mean, natural carbon capture is fine from trees and other types of biomass. But when you're adding uh, a carbon capture equipment to a coal plant or you're trying to suck carbon out of the air, you need electricity. Where does electricity come from? Well, in the best case, it's renewable electricity. But if you use renewable electricity, there's a limited amount of renewable electricity available, and we have a long way to go to eliminate all the fossil plants. If you use a renewable, renewable electricity to power direct air capture, which all it does is take CO, some CO2 out of the air, you're preventing that renewable electricity from replacing a coal plant or a gas plant or an oil plant or even uh, replacing uh, some high-temperature heat process in industry. And when you use elect renewable electricity to replace some kind of fossil plant, you not only eliminate more CO2 than you do uh, add carbon capture for the same electricity, but you also eliminate the air pollution, the fuel mining, and the fossil infrastructure from the plant. Carbon capture does none of this. It doesn't reduce fuel mining. It doesn't reduce fossil infrastructure. It doesn't reduce a, a single iota of air pollution. So, in fact, it because it takes out less CO2 than the same electricity that when replacing the coal or gas plant, you're actually increasing CO2 by running carbon capture equipment and sucking up all that electricity and wasting it. So we don't... And so, so blue so hydrogen some of the, is... So we'll, so, yeah. I was going to say, so while we'll, we'll, we'll some of these uh, in, in initiatives or solutions do offer hope or promise, that holistically they don't work because they contribute more negatives than they do positives. Yeah, they're opportunity costs. Um, like if you spend on small modular nuclear reactors, I mean, large reactors, they take right now in uh, Europe and the United States, the Vogel reactor just opened. Well, that was after 17 years between planning and operation. And so you have to, you know, in that small modular reactors, they may take a little uh, less time in 17, 18 years, but they're on the order. Still, they're still going to be between 10 and 20 years uh, between planning and operation. That's too late. And they, they're going to cost just as much as these large reactors, Vogel $35 billion, which is about $15, a little over $15 a watt versus $1 a watt for a new wind or solar. And when you look at the actual energy cost over time, it's about five to 10 times more expensive electricity. That's what you're going to get. You're going to get with nuclear, new nuclear, you're going to get much higher cost of electricity and you're going to get it a lot longer, a lot later. So when you're waiting around 15, 20 years for a nuclear plant coming, what's burning? It's, you're burning fuels, you're burning fossil fuels. So you're not going to, and you're also putting up a lot of cement. I mean, there was a, enough cement for the Vogel nuclear reactors to lay a sidewalk from Miami to Seattle. And that put wow. in so much CO2 that you're not gonna recover that CO2 for another 30, 40 years uh, of running this nuclear plant because you just have so much background emissions that have occurred. So. We, we need to focus on what works and what is clean, and that's clean renewable electricity. So we want to electrify everything, go to electric heat pumps for homes, for air heating, water heating, air conditioning, even electric, even drying clothes. You can use a heat pump, electric induction cooktops, LED lights, which were finally mandated in the U.S. after many years a few days ago. Uh, and we want to electrify everything, electric vehicles as much as possible, and like high temperature processes. And, and then provide the electricity with clean renewable energy. That's the most obvious, and that's what we should do. We shouldn't be sidetracked by these technologies, these miracle, what we call miracle technologies that don't actually do anything that cause negative impacts. Mark, you mentioned in your answer that, that um, in California in the summer, you could get up to 14%, I believe you said, of, uh, of, of energy. Uh, can we keep the grid stable with just renewables? Will that be sufficient and for all times of day and all times of year? Yeah, we find we can because, first of all, well, wind and solar are intermittent, but you do have, and there are 160 plus countries in the world that have hydropower, which is like a big battery. And in fact, there are there are 45 countries in the world that have, their, their grid is already 50 to 100% wind, water, solar, including nine countries that are 98.5 to 100%. Those are major, mostly dominated by hydropower. So you have hydropower, you have pumped batteries. So batteries and hydropower 
or really the two main ways to keep the grid stable in terms of storage. And we just did a study for Canada and found that you could run Canada's entire grid after you've electrified everything uh, and keep the grid stable with only existing hydropower used for both baseload and peaking power, no batteries, in fact. So you can run Canada with no batteries, no nuclear reactors, no bioenergy, no carbon capture, clean renewable energy, just increasing wind and solar and using existing hydropower to balance. But the other ways to do it are also what's called demand response. Utilities give people incentives to shift the time of their electricity. Where I live, for example, there are three rates for electricity. There's a there's a nighttime rate, a peak afternoon, early evening rate, and then there's a rate between. That, and the difference can be in the summer a factor of five in terms of the cost. So that incentivizes people to charge their electric cars after 11 p.m., for example. So that's demand response. Uh, so there's, very there's smart. also interconnected. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I was, uh, uh, thank you for that. I'm just going to just shift to Hank, uh, just conscious of time. I want to make sure we, we, uh, we, we get to so many of the questions that we have and also save time for the audience here. Um, and, and Mark just mentioned some of the other countries around the world that are already successfully doing this. Hank, Blue Planet Alliance was founded to take the brilliant success that you had in Hawaii and try to replicate that formula in the rest of the world, starting with island nations. Why are you starting with island nations? Well, the, the model is uh, what we did in the U.S. We started with the island of Hawaii, uh, the, which is a state. And then all the other states looked at us and say, wow, look what they just did. We can do that, too. And that's how I'd like uh, the world's countries to look at island countries. So we start with island countries. They have the highest cost of electricity because they import. They generally import diesel for their electricity. And they have the most, they, they're suffering the most damage from climate change with sea level rise and uh, hurricanes and typhoons. So these are, are on the forefront and they're the least responsible for, for what's happened. So um, they have the most to gain and the most to lose. And so that's a good place to start. Um, as we start flipping island countries, countries will start to notice and uh, hopefully we will uh, start a movement to flip them as well. Uh, it all starts with the decision. Uh, the people of an island or of a country or of any jurisdiction uh, just need a decision that they're going to be renewable, and then everything else happens after that. Um, but it's the decision and the determination to actually follow that through that is the start of, of any movement towards solving the climate problem. Excellent. And, and, and what countries have you engaged with so far, Hank? And, and, and second question is, have you found the app, what have you found the appetite to be like in the countries that are transitioning to 100% renewable? Yeah, beyond Hawaii. Yeah, like so, a, like a... yeah so we started um, with uh, American territories like uh, uh, Samoa and, uh, and uh, uh, sorry, um, Guam. But uh, the countries that we, we've been focusing mostly on, on uh, Pacific countries. So uh, we did Palau, uh, Tonga, Tuvalu last year. Uh, we've got a whole string of, of new countries that we're um, doing this year. And uh, we've got a program that we started where we bring three, four people from a country to Hawaii and show them what we did in Hawaii. And it should be somebody from the utility, somebody from the uh, government, some but anyway it's all the voices that need to be brought together uh, and this is the thing that, you, that usually doesn't happen people live in their little silos and they don't talk to each other and here we are we're taking the young leaders from all of these countries we're bringing them together showing what we did in Hawaii uh, exposing them to people who were in the government during the change so they could find out what we did and, and you know, even the utility because the utility is like wow this is such a great thing for us uh, we should help you do it for your utility in your country uh, because it's a win-win-win uh, situation. And uh, by the way, um, my feeling is if we don't have a deadline, if we don't have a clear deadline with a clear mission, it's not going to happen. Nothing, nothing happens without a deadline. It's like, yeah, maybe someday we're going to fix climate change. No, that's not the way it works. We have to have a decision that we're going to fix climate change by such and such a date. And what better date than the 100th anniversary of the United Nations? Excellent. 
Um, well, thank you both for taking uh, these one-on-one -on -one questions. And what I'd like to do now is ask you both questions and feel free to engage with each other on these answers. Uh, this question is for both of you. Let's look at activation. Um, we've already mentioned there are countries and states that are uh, already at or near 100% renewables on their grid. Do, do, we, do we need to rely on the special traits those countries may have? Is there a, is, or is there a replicable model that we can look to? Mark, why don't you take that first? Um, again, what we're asking here is, we know that there's countries that have already achieved this or are close to achieving this, but perhaps they have special traits. We're wondering if there are, if there are uh, replicable models that other countries can use that could be uniform. Well, each, there's going to be a different mix of renewables and storage in, in each uh, country or state. Uh, I'll point out actually in the U.S., I mean, surprisingly, South Dakota, uh, it actually provides about 85 percent of its electricity now, uh, or it, the electricity it generates from just wind and hydroelectric power, with most of it being wind. And in fact, in terms of their consumption, they, they can they generate 120 percent of the electricity that they actually consume from just wind about 77 percent and hydro the rest and the excess is exported they also produce fossil fuels that are exported but the point is you there are you can go state by state and there are actually six states in the u.s that are between 67 and 84 percent wind water solar in their generation and uh, i always won washington state uh, uh montana surprisingly is up there too but 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 most of it's hydro or and wind and solar is catching up but and then worldwide there are many as i mentioned before there are nine countries that are 98.5 to 100 percent wind water solar but they're dominated by hydro with some wind and some solar and actually big some have geothermal of the top 45 countries there are two, uh, three that are mostly wind and there's one that's mostly uh, geothermal electricity kenya and so there, there's a different model for there's not one way to do it but the, the thing they dominate is they, they all have some resource they have wind they either have wind or solar or both and a lot of them and there are 160 countries that have, have hydropower uh, but in storage it's readily available now and you know there, this is a growing not only movement but their the implementation of renewables is going like gangbusters worldwide i mean it's going much faster than uh, fossil fuel growth and definitely much faster than nuclear growth. Um, we see like 70, 80% of all new generation worldwide uh, each year for the last few years is just wind, water, and solar. And batteries are becoming more commonplace. Electric vehicles are coming, uh, becoming commonplace and growing rapidly. Heat pumps, Maine just uh, put up their 100,000th heat pump which is surprising it's actually per capita uh i mean norway leads the pack with about they're like about 29 heat pumps for every 100 people in norway yeah. and you know, france just passed uh four or five uh heat pumps for every 100 people maine is at seven so it even passed france in terms of the per capita heat pump and france is about 3.3 .3 million heat pumps so these things are growing worldwide and so there's not one pattern but they're just they have a common denominator of just wind water solar electrific yeah, I'd like to say that, um, you know, what, what all these countries have in, in common is that they made a decision. You know, if you go back far enough, Iceland made a decision and the decision was they didn't want to use coal anymore for uh, electricity or heat or hot water. And uh, that decision led to them to develop hydro and geothermal. And look at the country now, look at the economic boom that 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 was. I mean, this is in the 70s. So uh, people, some countries realized it early on, and the quicker you figure it out, the quicker you benefit from uh, the cheaper, more, uh, I wouldn't go to this so far as they're reliable, but the cheaper and more environmentally friendly renewable energy sources. Um, I would say that, you know, make the decision and then tell your engineers to go figure it out, because that's, that's what the engineers do. You know, go find out where your source is and, and use that. And, and in the worst case, if you don't have any source, you know, I was in Singapore and they asked me, so how are we going to do it? And I said, well, I, I don't I don't know how where you get it. I'm going to guess that you import LNG or something, natural gas from neighboring countries. Import hydrogen. Go and develop a, a, a wind farm or a solar farm in Australia and then import hydrogen. Uh, you can you can drag hydrogen across the ocean using hydrogen powered chips, and then when when you uh, when you use the hydrogen, what, what's the result of the you know fuel cell or even combustion? It's water. 
you know, it's, it's pure water. So it's not pollution of any kind. So, yeah, I, I kind of lo- I'm looking to a future where we develop the boundless source of energy, which is geothermal. You know, the center of this planet is still molten. <laughs> it's There's so much heat down there. And we can see the yeah. result of this in hot spots all across the world. You can see the ring of fire. You know, if, if all of the countries and all of the locations around the ring of fire started producing hydrogen and then exporting that to places that don't have any source, then we would solve the problem without without nuclear uh, and without definitely without fossil fuel or biofuel. Now, biofuel, I think, is uh, to me, is, is a disaster because basically what we're doing is we're we, we grow up and give you an example of Brazil. They started growing um, uh, sugarcane to make uh, to make biofuel. And what the sugarcane did is they displaced the cattle. And the, and what they did is then they cut down the forest so that they could grow more cattle. And, and so indirectly, we're destroying the forest to make biofuel. Um, and the other thing is biofuel is also food. You know, when you when you see corn that's b- being generated in the Midwest, that's 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 food not only for people but for for again for livestock. And when they started uh, taking a whole bunch of the corn out of the out of the economy, the price of tortillas in in Mexico went up by four times. But, I mean, these yeah. poor people. What you're doing is you're taking food out of their mouths and burning it for electricity. That does not make any sense Perfect. at all. For a short term, for a short term gain. Uh, all right, two more questions for you guys, and then we're going to open things up to the audience. And um, I believe we're, the uh, questions will just pop up on the bottom of the screen, so be prepared for that. But first, two more questions for for our panel. Uh, as noted, toward the end of 2023, we're nearing the 2030 deadline to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And as we mentioned, the IPCC report, which is a UN report. Uh, made it clear that we need to transition to 100% renewable energy. We're also on the cusp of the annual environmental season from September to December with key annual conferences such as UNGA, which is the UN General Assembly, and Climate Week NYC in New York in September, and the annual UN Climate Conference known as COP in November and December this year, which will be in Dubai in a in an oil state, uh, oddly, this year. Uh, what do we need to focus on and achieve in this absolutely critical 15-week gauntlet what do we need to get in terms of victories in these conferences? Hank, let's start with you. Um, what, what, what I believe the most important thing that we can do f- for humanity is to give them the understanding that we can actually do this and, and, the, and follow that up by the determination that we will do this. You know, that's the, the, the thing that's stopping us is not um, economics. It's not technology. It's the lack of willpower. As soon as we have willpower, then everything else falls into place. Engineers get to work. The politicians, uh, you know, pass the right laws. Um, so we need people to understand that it's not just doom and gloom, that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and we should be moving towards that light. Yeah, well, I agree with Hank. And in addition, we need so we need to educate the public and policymakers that it is possible to transition all countries of the world. But also, we need to get them off these, you know, get them away from these technologies that are not helpful, carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, electrofuel, small modular nuclear reactors, and even geoengineering. I mean, 40% of the inflation reduction at budget goes towards these, what I call useless technologies that do not help and are opportunity costs. And most of them, they carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, electrofuels, those are basically constructs of the fossil fuel industry to keep themselves alive. They want those technologies to be promulgated throughout the world as a disguise to so allows them to keep burning fossil fuels and claiming credits that they're reducing CO2. And so they are pushing for all these subsidies and they've hoodwinked most of the world because a lot of the world is, is still pushing, is allowing carbon capture to be subsidized uh, direct air capture is being, is being pushed and, and included in, the, in subsidies. So I think we need to get not only focused on what we can do in terms of clean renewable energy, but we have to stop this distraction away and keep funding away from these technologies that are not useful. Excellent. And uh, one more question, but before we do, uh, I'm getting some 
feedback that there uh, it, that the sound isn't coming through is as long uh, just let us know in the chat if you can hear us um, or let the producer uh, the producer here know just to make sure that all the volume is uh, is adjusted. But uh, let's go on to the last question here uh, from me. Um, it can feel so hopeless to be on the sidelines watching the climate emergency play out in excruciating real time. What can individuals do to assist in the transition to a renewable future? Because we know that uh, we have to rely so often on the public sector or the private sector. Tell us. Uh, Mark, why don't you start? What, what, can, what, what can individuals do to make a difference? Well, in your own life, uh, the next time you need a, a new stove, go to an electric induction cooktop, you can weatherize your home, sealing doors and windows, change your light bulbs to LED light bulbs. Uh, next water heater should be a heat pump water heater. Next home heating system should and cooling system should be heat pump, air conditioner, air heater. Next vehicle should be an electric vehicle. Uh, even a dr clothes dryer should be a heat pump dryer. Try everything. Try to look at everything in your life that you do, and does it involve combustion, and to see if it's possible to eliminate that source of combustion. And then, just also in terms of policies, you want to favor policymakers who are on board with transitioning to clean, renewable energy. So use your voting and your uh, in your own life to try to transition. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I look at all parts of my life and see where I can uh, where I can most change things. Um, so um, uh, my properties in Hawaii, I have a ranch and I have a house in Hawaii and they're off grid completely solar with solar and batteries. So we learn how to do it. Um, all of the vehicles that I drive in Hawaii, they're all electric vehicles and they're being charged by the solar at home. So there's zero carbon footprint there. Um, I spend a lot of time in New York. Um, I either walk or ride a bicycle or take public transportation. And, you know, if that's possible, if that's an option, then definitely that's the way to go. Um, so you can make all kinds of changes in your own personal life. Um, you know, just look at, at what you do. And, and like Mark says, you know, yeah, next time you do a buy decision, buy the right thing that's that's going to not be evil for the future of, of humanity and, and nature. Excellent. Um, I have other questions, but like, uh, let's open it up now to um, uh, Bart and team. If you have a, uh, if you have questions for the audience, let us know, pop them up. There we go. And let me read this one here. Uh, are, nu are nuclear power plants like Diablo Canyon safe uh, and a good use of resources as we try to... Sorry? Okay. Oh. Bart, do you, want to, do you want to read the question, Bart? Are, are nuclear power plants... Um, let's see, I'm, I, I have trouble with, with the way the... Oh, he, okay, uh, are, are nuclear power plants like the Diablo Canyon safe and a good use of resources as we try to make the swift transition to renewables? Let's start with uh, Mark on that one. Well, Diablo Canyon is on an earthquake fault, so whether it's safe or not will depend if there's an earthquake or not, if it's large. But it's being subsidized to say, but it was scheduled to close with this year or next year, two reactors, but it's now being the governor of California change the change the decision so that and after accepting 1.5 billion dollars of funds so it's gonna they're gonna take 1.5 billion dollars of funds but there's a new estimate by an organization that estimates that keeping it open will cost uh, taxpayers consumers of, on the order of 30 billion dollars over a period of 10 or 15 years but so it's not a good idea to keep nuclear reactors open that are scheduled to close if they require subsidy if they don't require subsidy, okay well they can probably stay open a little longer but there are many reactors that require that are not economically beneficial and are costing huge amounts of money to to ratepayers. In addition, there's a, we want to grow in California a lot of offshore wind, and there's only one major transmission line to the coast, and that goes right near Diablo Canyon. So basically, Diablo Canyon is hogging most of that transmission line and will slow down the development of offshore wind off the coast of Central California. Uh, where it's sorely needed uh, for distribution to Los Angeles, for example. So not only is it costing, we can take that same money and subsidy money and completely replace Diablo Canyon with renewables and open up the offshore wind. So keeping it open is really a bad decision and there's no benefit to it. California is already 50% renewables and has a law to go to 100%, it's one of the laws Hank mentioned, to go to 100% clean renewable energy 
uh, by 2045 as well. And, but I think we're already 50%. We'll probably get there by 2030, 2035. So we, there's no need for Diablo Canyon to stay open. Yeah, so Mark, I lived in Japan. For, hey, sorry, I lived me, in Japan for eight, 18. Yeah, so I lived in Japan for 18 years. And, you know, the, the, end, the level of engineering and how careful they are and all of that um, is, yeah, incredible. And yet, under those conditions, you know, we have Fukushima. Uh, so it's ridiculous to, to think that uh, every, you know, every nuclear situation is safe. I mean, look at what's going on in, in Ukraine. You have a little bit of conflict. And, you know, any, I, I would say any single source of, of power in the future is a weak point in the system. Um, you know, my, I believe that the future is uh, distributed energy and uh, local energy, and then there's no single point of failure. And then you don't, uh, at the end of the day, if we really have local energy, then we don't need all those power lines everywhere. And power lines are a waste of space. Uh, and they're uh, a waste of electricity because, you know, it costs electricity to push the to push the juice through those lines. There's a lot a lot of lost in the transla- uh, transmission. So yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of locally generated wind and solar, and then local storage. And if you run short, then you ask your neighbor for some, you know, that kind of thing. That's just the way it should be in the future. All right. Let's see if we have another question from the audience. Sorry, my mic is blocking. Uh, how do we scale this technology Sorry, to yeah. make it feasible? Thank you. Sorry, my, 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 my controls were blocking the <laughs> text. Hank, why don't you go first? Got it. Well, yeah, um, so basically we, what we should need to do is divert some of the seven trillion dollars that we use to subsidize fossil fuel and use it to subsidize renewable energy. If that's the behavior that we want to see in the future is 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 renewable energy, well, we should make that more profitable. And and right now it's an unlevel, it's not a level playing field. And as long as as we continue to subsidize oil, coal, and gas, uh, you know, it's hard for these new technologies to scale. But the, the, the real thing, thing that's happening is they're already scaling. So even though, even though uh, we're subsidizing the bad guys, <laughs> we're still going to win this war. Yeah, I mean, technologies are scaling. I mean, solar is scaling amazingly. Like in the last 15 months in uh, South Africa, for example, there were, I think, 3.3 gigawatts of rooftop solar was installed in 15 months alone. So we we need policies, effective policies to go to 100% renewables, first of all, not only in the electric power sector, but also in the transportation sector, in the building sector, and also in industry. And once you have those policies in place, then it's, it's easier to guide resources to solving these problems. And so it's a combination of, of have the pol- putting the policies in place, and then w- once we were just, we start building, then the costs come down. We've seen this as well. You know, once you start building on a large scale, costs of solar, wind, batteries, uh, fuel cells, uh, heat pumps, they all have dropped. And so this is a good thing. And we, But we got to, again, not divert ourselves into spending money and spending 40% of our available funds on technologies that don't work, like carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, electrofuel, small modular nuclear reactors, and and any type of bioenergy. We need to stay away from those technologies and focus on clean renewable energy. That's what works. Can you believe it? There's uh, there's still laws on the books in, in uh, Florida that, that outlaw rooftop solar. And, you know, that kind of thing happens in a lot of places where uh, the utilities have so much power. I mean, not, it's not, the, they have it's so not the only unusual law power. coming not the only Political unusual power. law coming out of Florida these days. <laughs> yeah, and and we what we need to do is it, we need to take the power back from from the from the utilities. I mean, they're supposed to be helping us. We're, we're not. We don't exist to, to help the utilities. The utilities help, help uh, exist to help us. And so, um, if there's a better way, then they have to come around. And for 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 one, you know, having all those empty roofs makes no sense at all um it's yeah how many gigawatts of rooftop solar can they have 
they're, they're, they're leaving energy on the table, as it were. Um, let's go to the next question. And apologies if my controls will block the reading here. I, I what else can we do? Uh, it might just take a second for it to fade for me here. Uh, there we go. What else can we do besides vote and write to our politicians to help break the political barrier and aid the transition? Mark, do you want to go well, first on this one? I mean, I think education is very important. So forums like this, but you know, any type of educational forum that we can get the information out to large numbers of people that it is possible to transition and here are some of the steps that individuals can do and that policymakers can do. Uh, you know, the more people are educated, I actually think that the public, I mean, opinion, opinion polls I've seen indicate that about 80 to 82 percent of the public, no matter if it's in the U.S. or internationally, other countries, uh, favor 100 percent renewables. And the same, I saw this one particular poll where is found it more than 80% in, in 11 countries favored 100% renewables, but only 59% of the people believe that climate change was an important problem. So the only good thing about that is that, you know, people are interested in solving the problem, even if they don't care about the problem or don't think the problem exists. <laughs> and so that's fine. If, you, if, you're, if you're agreeable to the solution, uh, then we don't care if you care about, if you know about the problem. Um, but the policymakers, though, tend to be the types who are uh, who maybe in the, those people who don't believe in climate change. So we have to, you know, we have to focus on the solution. There are actually in the U.S., for example, several states, there are nine out of the 10 states with the most wind are states that uh, are heavily Republican states that they tend to not um, like renewable energies and, and renewable energy policies. In fact, many of those states don't have policies, but the wind, wind is so cheap. And solar is becoming so cheap that renewables are growing like gangbusters regarding party affiliation, which is good. On that point, so, Mark, uh, on, on that point, Mark, what, uh, isn't it true that uh, in the latest heat dome crisis in Houston that the grid would have absolutely disintegrated if it were not for the renewables? So renewables really saved Texas, even though there's a lot of disbelief about climate change in Texas. Yeah, I mean, there you know, several uh, stories and studies have indicated that the amount of solar and wind really helped keep the grid stable in Texas. And, you know, it should be obvious that solar, especially in the hottest days in California, you know, you're producing a lot of solar. I remember the hottest day in 2020, I produced, I, I charted this on my own roof, I produced 15 kilowatt hours more than I used for all the air conditioning I needed for the, from the heat pumps. And I sent that to the grid. And I was thinking, well, and that was a day where the grid was going to face blackouts because of over electricity consumption for air conditioning. And if everybody had rooftop solar, there would be no blackouts for sure, because you're producing so much solar on days that are really hot in California or Texas or any southern state. And that it's really... Uh, it's really foolish not to push more rooftop solar. Just a quick so uh, interruption. Is, I, think we, I, I, think we, I think we have five minutes left. I know Bart wanted to get in a question, uh, and maybe he can ask that directly to Hank. Oh, Hank, that reminds me of, of the work that we were doing a long time ago in Puerto Rico, um, I, because I just got a, a, an invitation to join some nuclear energy small group that wants to try and bombard the island with uh, a nuclear power plant. I'm just thinking, from all that I've read, that, that island can be 100% renewable in, in less than 10 years. Uh, how do we put your playbook on that, um, on that island? <laughs> or on every island? Yeah, so yeah. I was um, uh, recently uh, in Korea, and, and uh, a politician asked me, so what kind of policy should we pass? And uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, okay, first of all, tell, tell your children the truth about climate change. And then ask them what you should do. Because your children, you know, they don't have any political problem. They don't have any economics. They just purely think about what is the answer to the problem. So to get to the adults, to get to, you know, the intrans intransigent adults, uh, get to their children speak to their children and there are a lot of a lot of young people who are activists today and i remember i used to be an activist when i was in high school you know we we, we uh, basically 
demonstrated against the war in Vietnam and we stopped that war. Well, this time the young people are going to demonstrate against uh, fossil fuel and they're going to end fossil fuel. This is what's going to happen. Uh, all, we, all we need to do is give them the room and, uh, uh, and listen to them because they're, they're the ones who are going to be living in that future. It's their future that we're ruining. So when you say the we in that question is we, is we old people need to listen to they, the young people, uh, who, who just tell, will tell it like it is. That's a great point. That's a great, that's a, go ahead, Bart. You know, no, that's such an amazing, uh, inspirational answer. I, I just wanted to share that at the St. Lawrence Foundation, one of our primary concerns is the 3.6 million pounds of nuclear waste stored in San Onofre, California. It's the deadliest poison on the planet. It's stored in, in metal canisters, prone to corrosion, cracking, no monitoring on a, on a no, known seismic area across from earthquake bay, 100 feet from rising seas subject to terrorism and natural catastrophes. It wouldn't be honest if I didn't tell you that the waste from this this uh, uh, nuclear power plants are just, it, it, as Ed Maybach said, this is a disaster waiting to happen. So if it did, parts of Southern California would be essentially uninhabitable for 100,000 years or more. So 9 million people are in this area. Um, the, the, so the waste left behind is a huge problem for California and a lot of a lot of our colleagues working on this. Let's say we have political will. Let's just say that we have political will. How quickly can California move away from dirty energy to clean renewables? Well, that's um, a big question. Yeah. So we're at in terms of electricity, California is at fifty percent wind, water, solar, and is adding a lot each year. So it's, it could, I think it, if we actually didn't waste money on Diablo Canyon, for example, I think we could get to 100% by 2030. And that's, and yeah, and then, then we have to focus on other sectors too, because that's just electricity. There's transportation, there's buildings, and there are a lot of laws in, in uh, lots of towns and cities around California. I think there are at least 40 cities and towns that have banned uh, new natural gas and, and new homes new construction homes and other buildings, as New York City did as well. Uh, so that's really the next big step is to eliminate, to get rid of gas in new, not only new homes, but also to retrofit existing homes to get rid of gas and also to get go through electric vehicles. Uh, you know, California has a lot of electric vehicles compared to other states, but compared to how many vehicles, it's still pretty small, and we need a large-scale transition there. So th this is all... So the technologies are all here, but we have to get people's awareness up. The benefits, like going to an uh, electric vehicle, saves you so much money in terms of fuel costs. It'll save on the order of twenty to thirty thousand dollars in fuel costs uh, over fifteen years when you're driving fifteen thousand miles a year. So even if you have a higher automobile cost, it's still beneficial to transition. So I, I just want to have time to thank you, yeah, Mark Z. Jacobson, I, Professor, I want to I want to really thank you and Hank. That can't have enough gratitude from the San Juan's Foundation and Lance. I'll let you take it over after I just thank you for this amazing discussion. Oh, thank you for for, for hosting this for for bringing us all together. Thank you both, Hank and Mark, for the spirit of discussion today for all the wisdom that you shared with us today. We definitely have our challenges ahead, certainly, but the hope that you're giving us is absolutely. Uh, inspiring. That concludes the program today. To rewatch the webinar or to see a transcript, go to the Samuel Lawrence Foundation website next week when both will be posted. The website, which is also the should be in the chat, is samuellawrencefoundation.org. Thank you so much to our partners, Beyond Nuclear, Sierra Club Canada, Mothers for Peace. To learn more about the critical work that all of the participating parties are doing to advance renewable energy and other sustainable initiatives, please follow Hank Rogers, H E N K and Mark Z. Jacobson on social media, as well as the Samuel Lawrence Foundation, Blue Planet Alliance, and Brooklyn Story Lab. Also, sign up to join Blue Planet Alliance, to join the Alliance itself. That info will be in the chat, and it's blueplanetalliance.org slash pledge. Please check out Mark's book, No Miracles Needed, and sign up for the newsletters of Samuel Lawrence Foundation, Brooklyn Story Lab, and Blue Planet Alliance to stay informed about upcoming events and important initiatives. Thank you so much. And goodbye to everyone.